creation, origin, separation, and migration of the Crow Nation. This is an educational program covering the creation, origin, separation, and migration of the Crow Nation. Many cultures retain their stories and memories by telling and retelling the information and pass them down from one generation to the next. This is called oral history. Stories of the creation, origin, separation, and migration of the Crow Nation are well known by most members of the tribe. Today we will be listening to three highly respected Crow tribal elders who were interviewed for their knowledge and expertise in the oral history of the Crow people. Throughout the narrations, note the repetition. Dr. Barney Old Coyote is known as Young White Buffalo Bullcap, a member of the Whistling Water Clan of the Crow Nation. Dr. Old Coyote is a founder and member of the Crow Cultural Committee. Dr. Joseph Medicine Crow was appointed the official tribal historian by the Crow Tribal Council. His Indian name is Highbird. He is a member of the Whistling Water Clan of the Crow Nation. Winona Plenty Hoops is one of the most important religious leaders of the Crow Nation in her role as the sacred seed mixer of the Tobacco Society. Her Indian name is Old Medicine Dress, and she is from the Sore Lip Clan. The Crow stories of creation were very detailed. There were songs and many helpers or beings involved in the first maker's process of creating the land, the mountains, wildlife, and the first human beings. In this program, we will hear the Crow elders summarize the story of creation as it is told among the Crow tribe. The Creator created all kinds of uh, beings around, but uh, there was no land. There was, uh, there was water everywhere. And uh, being as all-powerful as he was, uh, as he is, uh, he looked around and he said, uh, it's very lonely, I, I'm all alone. Uh, I need to do something to populate this place, but there's really no land. He said, I need someone to occupy this land who thinks and uh, believes as I do and does things as I do. So he called upon his animals and uh, some, of the, some of the beings. What we need is some, some mud, some earth. So go to the bottom of the sea and bring some. The coyote disappeared underwater but uh, came up with nothing. He did that with several of the beings and then he uh, finally saw some ducks uh, floating around and he called them his little brothers. He said, uh, brothers, I want one of you to go down and see if you can come up with some semblance of what's really, uh, really where we are. So the duck dove down and dove three times, and the fourth time he came up and he had some mud on his bill. And he said, that's what it is. He said, that's what I'm looking for. He said, uh, where did you get that? And he says, I went down as deep as I could and picked this up on the bottom. And he says, there's no more water below that. So he took that and he, he fashioned a model in the image of himself. And then they say that, uh, that we are told that he, after he made the image, he breathed into it and gave it life and gave the human beings their lives. But still, there was still water everywhere. So he took more of that mud and then created the hills and the mountains. And then he went from where he was and uh, made, the, made the earth as, as, as a place where human beings could live so that he was not lonely because uh, the the creature that he created was in his own image, and they say we are people in the image of the Creator, and that uh, he created everything, and I mean everything, uh, all the animals, the birds, the, the rocks, the trees, uh, the rivers uh, formed in his uh, in, in his direction, uh, how he 
how he perceived the world as the way we see it today. He said that uh, no place will be the same. Every place will be different. And that way, all the animals will be different from one another. Uh, there's no such thing as everything being alike is the way, uh, the, the way it's related, how the creator approached this creation of his. But it was all full quiet. No sound, nothing moving, except the leaves <coughs> moving in the wind. So he said, this is no good. Let's, let, let's make uh, some animals. Pretty soon they heard a, uh, some birds chattering over there. So animals started moving around and making sound. Some animals were in the water, jumping out of water. Some flying away up in the air, tree, <clears throat> sky and sitting on. So he left and came back again to check. And you know, there are even more animals and the place is even prettier. And he said, I will, make, I will make this land in a way that some will have a high place to live, others will have a low place to live. I will bring them down to the water, but they won't live underwater. There's other creatures that will remain in the water. And they say the Creator said, these places, there'll be places where the mountains will be home to some, some of these things that I've created. Other places will be away from the mountains. Other places will be a combination. And for, for that reason, he placed the mountains in a way that some were very high, where very few beings could live. Other places were uh, bountiful, where a lot of, a lot of uh, beings could exist. And that's why we have uh, carnivores and non-carnivores, and uh, animals that feed on the earth, and some that feed on the roots, that feed uh, feed from the bounty of the land, and it, it varies from, from the seashore up to the tops of the mountains. And that's a characteristic that uh, they explain in talking about the mountains. So I said, you know, this is all nice, but no one here to enjoy this. Let's make a, a man like a sow. So he went down to the... <coughs> Quick there and got some mud and worked it over and worked the arms and legs and worked it over and made magic. And there stood in front of a young man. <laughs> so looked him over and said, Now look, said, look all around you. Hear those birds? See those animals over there? Said, Oh, and look at those nice fruit on trees, berries, cherries, but all the yours now. So he left, came back to check up on his man, he said, uh, let's make a partner for him. So while he was asleep, he went over there and took a rib out of here and took another one out of here and put the ribs together and made strong magic. <laughs> they stood in front of him, a beautiful young lady all dressed up nice and said to the young man, look at her, it's a woman, it's your wife. After a while, you will have children, just look like you. After a while, <clears throat> came back to check over the two people there and <clears throat> left her. And looked around, there were a lot of them by now, you know, all in one big group, you know. So he walked around, of course, they didn't notice him. He walked around, looked, little kids fighting each other, and, and uh, young men bragging about themselves. Looked them over, said, this is no good, let's separate these. Some way down there, uh, it was summer all the time, or, lived in the desert, and some way up here by the ocean e e eating fish, and some here uh, <coughs> eating uh, buffalo and wild animals. So it looked like he looked them over, and, he, and then they're doing all right. Now, this is good. Look around, there's a small area. 
said, I have enough room here to make a smaller tribe. So I'm going to do that. So made magic again. And there's some people there. Said, look around you. Said, I'm giving you a good, good place to live here. Good scenery, good seasons, all kinds of berries, cherries, roots to eat. Game is a good place. I'm going to give it to you now. It's all yours. But these other people will see you <coughs> living in a good place, and they're going to try and come and take you. So I'm going to make your young men, your men, good warriors, powerful. So they will protect it forever and ever. That's <coughs> the origin of the Crow Indian as a tribe. <laughs> That, in essence, is the storyline of the creation story. I did not go into all the detail about this animal and that animal, or this mountain or that river, uh, this tree or that tree. There are scientific theories of how American Indian tribes came to the North American continent, but the Crow people have their own stories of origin. The Crow tribal elders explain what the Crow oral histories are. Our point of reference is always back to our people, the Biruga, that this is our country. And uh, the Hidatsa uh, is a name that they use uh, that are given to them by other tribes, neighboring tribes, and then the English print it and say Hidatsa, and then they call us Crow. And uh, as we understand it, we're just one people. We're the same. Uh, we are relocated members of that uh, tribe. We don't live in the same place. But however, the Crow people say that our uh, people before we, before we became Crows were in this country, and they were in the mountains. The Creator said, I made different places for different beings, and uh, I'm going to put some people in this particular area and they call that place what is now Cloud Peak in, in Wyoming, uh, and that's uh, the, the name that the crows use to this day. These people once lived in southern Appalachia, in the southeast, in what is now the states of us, South Carolina, Georgia, maybe northern Florida. That group, they were there. Then, <clears throat> before the coming of the European men, 1492, <laughs> before even way before that time, they, these groups started moving out of there for some reason, heading northwestward. Anyhow, the ancestral tribe of the of Sado, okay, the Crow Indians. <clears throat> had come also northwestward, and from the stories that I have uh, <clears throat> gathered together, from old time Crow Indian storyteller, that once upon a time that they live in what I would regard now as a Great Lakes area, it's probably in Wisconsin. They had uh, villages there, and they. They were farmers. They raised beans and and uh, squash and things like that. And then, of course, they ate fish there in the ponds there and hunt deer and animals around there. And that's where they lived for a while. Now, the, our storytellers have taken me that far back. Now, said, they reported that they kept going west, crossed the big river probably Mississippi, phase two or episode two, they moved from, uh, let's say, Wisconsin to Minnesota, northward, and then came to a river that kind of <clears throat> meanders around and then came to a big lake. I think that is Lake uh, 
uh, Winnipeg in Canada. Now our storytellers could tell us, take us right there. Anyhow, they left there. They left there and headed out west. So they did. They came to a, a river from the Black Hills country called Knife River. And there they set up their own village, and after a while they start uh, 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 building other little villages around there. And that's, that's, <clears throat> that's where we, we settled. As the Crow people migrated, they would eventually settle in the Missouri River area and were a part of the tribe that we know today as the Hidatsa. This was the mother tribe of the Crow. They would separate from the Hidatsa under the leadership of No Intestines, also known as No Vitals, and move further west and south, looking for a promised land of mountains. Doctors Old Coyote and Medicine Crow and Winona Plenty Hoops tell us why they split from their mother tribe. <laughs> Or Kamilk Sari, Jim at Bauks and Mirbage, there was no game. Bijeg, you shushed out of Karagon, uh, Ma, Yak, Mahaji, Kodas, Sawagon, Mahamnet, take Aris, Uyas, Edik, uh, Kara, while game, Kodaget, the cooker. the Missouri River shot the gun, cut the little caracol, how are they called it? Now are they with your mother? The sheep No intestines. Sheep did a. It's a long story, but they say that Red Scout and uh, no intestines, sheep did a were brothers, and uh, their father told them it's about time that you went out and had some idea of who you are and what you're going to be. And uh, that was uh, literally a charge to go on a fast and uh, beseeching your, your creator, uh, let me know who I am. So they went on a fast, and they tell us that it was by a big lake. And sometimes we try to trace back where it was and uh, as there's a popular thought that says it was probably Devil's Lake in what is now North Dakota. So <clears throat> the two men, the leaders, one called uh, East Muradish, or no insides or no vitals, and his brother. But anyhow, they decided <clears throat> to go fast and try to seek the assistance, advice, and help of the first maker. So one brother went up the shore that way and the other one went that way. And after three, four days, they came back. No vitals. The first maker has given me these. They're seeds, pots. That's not for my body. Food for my body. That's food for my spirit, my soul. These are sacred. The first maker told me to take these seeds out west to the high hills of mountains. And there, plant them. Because I'm going to give you, I'm taking you to a good, good place to live. Everything good is there. 
So <clears throat> that was his gift with vision. So they came back and uh, told the people about it, and they decided, they all decided to move on, move westward. Anyhow, they transported <clears throat> everybody across the Missouri River. The people who left the Hidatsa called themselves Biluga, those on our side. Soon, they were known as the Raven people, or the Crows. They were actually Apsaloga, the children of the large-beaked bird, probably in reference to the Raven. The first Euro-Americans misinterpreted the name. The migration of the Apsaloga took them on a journey to their promised land, to the mountains of southern Montana and northern Wyoming. They had very similar visions or visitations, and uh, it told them, this is a ceremony. Do this ceremony, and your people will be strong, and they'll increase. And uh, he, sh he showed them a plant, and uh, Red Scout was shown the, the corn and how to cultivate the corn, how to harvest it, and how to cultivate it and do this ceremony that surrounded the planting of the corn and the use of it and keeping of it. No intestines told a very similar story, almost word for word of what his brothers saw, except that the plant that he was shown was a tobacco plant in the foothills of mountains. That's where he saw it. So in his visitation, he saw these mountains, he saw the foothills, and that's where the, uh, the tobacco plant grew. And it's the wild mountain tobacco plant. And uh, the crows call it Ichichie. There's no mountains in, in, uh, in Hidatsa Crunchy, uh, down to Missouri. He uh, started going west. Look back in those, a nice group there. About 400, they said. So he moved out. Of course, naturally, they followed the Missouri River, you know. There's always water and, and uh, shade and uh, wood for their fires. So they followed the river and came out west. But any of the, the bulk of the, this tribe moved southward. And uh, when they started from there, they might, I might call that phase four, finally came to a large lake, they said. And they so large they couldn't see the other side. And it's so salty they couldn't drink it. Great Salt Lake. Uh, they hit the mountains. They looked for the plant. He looked for the plant, and they went as far north as Canada. And they spent a very harrowing winter at a place in Canada called Crow's Nest. And it rises to about 12,000 feet. But they went to that front because the mountain is right here. The plain is right here. So that's the foothills. They looked for it, they didn't find it there. He followed, they followed the mountain range south, and their stories reveal that they even visited what is now the Salt Lake. And uh, always they were looking for that plant at the foothills. They went so far south that they literally ran out of the mountains, when, where the mountain, Rocky Mountains kind of turn into the high, pla uh, high plateau down there around the Arkansas River. So. They went that far south, they didn't find it, so they came back north again. They followed that river. And uh, when they go down to the river to get water or take quick dips, you know, they would notice on the walls of the river there, arrowheads and stone uh, tools sticking out of there. And uh, so they, was, they call that Arrowhead River, and that is Canadian River. That cuts, comes out of so southern Colorado and through Panhandle of Texas, Oklahoma, on up to Mississippi, Canadian River. Anyhow, they followed that river, 
I'm pretty sure that's the route that the crows uh, took. And they came there after they left the North Platte, say about Casper, Wyoming, well, they just, they were on the move then. He fasted, he went on top of Cloud Peak and he fasted there. And when he, when the leader fasted up there, uh, they told him, you come to the right place, this is it. He says, what you're looking for is down there. So he looked down from on top of a cloud peak, the sand crane catch those wind currents, and they float up there and do their hunting from up there. But uh, it's called where the sand crane uh, lights or sits. <laughs> Bighorn Nakago. Akinna Bighorn, not Bighorn, but Ilk Ko Ohagi, so we say who Ilk Sheridan Chisa Oela Hirije Emma Ohagi, so we say who. They probably came along the north side of the Bighorn Mountains, maybe on top, and finally came to the uh, Sheridan, Wyoming area, Buffalo, Wyoming area, and and they looked around. There's buffalo there, good grass, all kinds of mountain streams, all kinds of wild fruits, berries. So they looked around after. A few weeks looking around there and that part may be right through here too. So this is it. This is it. So because of that, that's why we, we go back to the story of when uh, the Creator said, I'm going to put somebody here. Uh, it's going to be on the, the lower reaches of this mountain, uh, Cloud Peak. That's why we say we're the chosen ones to be put here. Because in the beginning, in the creation, when he put people different places, he, he was, was, it was, it was told that it was Cloud Peak, and he says, we're gonna put you here, nobody's gonna move you, this will be your home. And uh, when he found the plant, it was on the slopes of uh, Cloud Peak, just like they told in the, cre in the creation story. So that's how come the separation came. They finally found the promised land now. To me, that is one of the most fantastic and dramatic Indian migration. That was quite a migration, but they were motivated with this vision of no violence, of coming to a good place to live. This is the heart of that good country promise to no violence, right here in northern Wyoming and southern Montana. We're still in the very heart of it. Today, the Crow, who believed they were created to eventually live in the Bighorn Mountains, live on a reservation located in southeastern Montana. They still retain ownership of part of the northern range of the Bighorn Mountains as part of the Crow Reservation. We have just heard the educational program on the creation, origin, separation and migration of the Crow Nation. The American Indian Tribal Histories Project would like to thank the three tribal elders who assisted us in this segment, Dr. Barney Old Coyote, Dr. Joseph Medicine Crow, and Winona Plenty Hoops. <laughs>